So good morning, everyone. It is great to be with y'all. It's a little disconcerting to just stare at the block boxes with your white names printed in them, um, because I don't really know if you're enjoying what you're hearing or, or not. So I'm gonna um, try uh, to, to move pretty quickly through this because of that and, and not go too long. And Emily, I don't know how many people there are, but is, is it appropriate to have questions during the talk or should everybody hold them till the end? Um, I'll let you, I'll let you um, decide how you want to handle that. But there's 16 folks on here. Um, it seems like people have been really good about um, not talking over each other. So if you want to take questions during your talk, feel free. I'll let you handle well, let's that. Let's try it. Let's okay. try it. I really like, I'd rather much rather have a conversation than um, just talk at the screen here. So we'll give it a whirl. And if you have any questions or need clarification during the talk, please um, don't hesitate to dive in. I am going to build off of Mike Peeler's presentation from a couple weeks ago, just a little bit, uh, when he was talking about oysters and their value to society and the role they play and the, the important ecosystem services we gain from them. So I'm gonna stay in that coastal environment and talk about ecosystem services, but talk about coastal wetlands and a little bit more about resilience. So this is a project that we just got funded and I say we, you can see the project team there. We have a nice group from multiple agencies and groups with a wide range um, of expertise that they're bringing to the table. So it's keeping in the system, a decision tool for the beneficial use of dredge sediment and it's funded by NOAA. And um, I have some awesome results to tell you all about today. I'm just kidding. I've only had this project for a month, so I don't have any results. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the project, what's involved, and a little bit of background. Where did, where did this all come from? So we all know coastal marshes are important. They're good. Lots of ecosystem services. I will note that this cartoon was missing carbon storage. So I went ahead and tacked that on. It's probably not the most important or biggest ecosystem service that coastal marshes provide, but it certainly is important. So we derive these benefits from these uh, coastal wetlands and they are persistently going to be challenged now and even more so into the future um, in the face of rising seas and this idea of inadequate sediment supply. And we'll talk about why sediment supply is so important in a minute. The focus of this project is primarily on the protective services of coastal wetlands. So the protection of infrastructure, whether it be roads or ports or national defense installations or municipalities. And when you're protecting coastal or when you're providing resilience for the protective ecosystem services of wetlands, you're also of course, um, helping those non-protective ecosystem services like water quality or even the societal pieces like um, access to recreation and fishing. And, and again, I should also mention that the primary nursery area for the, um, the non-protective services that, that are provided by coastal wetlands. So by doing one, you, you grab all the protective services and really increase resilience across the board. So this um, graphic here is from uh, some modeled habitat coverage um, under sea level rise scenarios through 2100. And this was some work that was done at Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune. This happens to be a place called Freeman Creek along the Intracoastal Waterway. And if we, we start off with 2013 as the initial condition, and that would be your upper right panel, I think, if it's up my upper left panel. And as you move through to the year 2100, we show a scenario of 0.8 meter sea level rise, and the marsh shows good resilience, but that's really an underestimate of a reasonable prediction of sea level rise by the year 2100. So if you look at 2.5 meters, which are the bottom two, by year 2065, you see a little bit of conversion to open water, but by year 2100, we've essentially lost this marsh, right? And marshes will respond in a variety of ways to these rising levels of sea and um, perhaps an inadequate sediment supply. So one is that horizontal expansion where marshes will migrate into the uplands, but if there's something behind the marshes, whether it be a really steep scarp or a house or a Department of Defense installation, there is no room for those marshes um, to migrate. They also can transition to a more flood tolerant vegetation. So if they happen to be a little bit more up estuary, a little bit higher in the tidal frame, they probably have juncus on them right now. But as seas rise again, they will probably convert to spartina. So we'll see a conversion in marsh type. 
Uh, marshes can also have vertical accretion, and that's what we're really focusing on in this project. The accretion um, of sediment vertically, and that's how marshes are maintaining their elevation. And of course, that final alternative that you see again in that bottom left corner is that the marshes drown. So a lot of factors affect these. Um, of course, the rate of sea level rise, uh, marsh plant growth, so how productive the marshes are, how much suspended sediment concentration is available for the vertical accretion, and again, those slopes um, and adjacent lands to determine if marshes are going to be able to migrate into the future. So with these sort of challenges in mind, we need to start thinking about resilience and the things that we can affect. And just another little graphic on um, one of the responses, which is marsh, marshes moving landward. This sort of speaks to future development, future land use planning, thinking about marsh resilience and ecosystem services to always try to not get to the point where your marshes maybe need sediment added to them because you've allowed them to migrate into the uplands. So a little Q&A here, why does sand need to be kept in the system? Because there isn't any more of it. I think a lot of people think sand is just kind of everywhere and it moves around everywhere and when there's not enough sand in one place, sand comes from other places unless you live on a beach that is sand starved and you realize there is no more sand. It just doesn't flow into system. So we can talk about things called sediment cells or littoral cells. And these are areas where the movement of material is largely contained. Um, you can sort of think of it as a closed system. It's not completely closed, of course. Um, we have changes in wind and direction of movements of ocean currents and things like that super high energy conditions that can cause sediment to move within, or I should say among cells. But in general, sediment cells are closed systems. These are regional areas where sediment is confined. So the import and export is confined within that area. Um, and they're often determined by topography, shape of the coastline, things like that. Um, the boundaries can be headlands. So you can see here in this image, Ochre coke is in a different sub, and I say sub sediment cell because sediment cells tend to be very large. By example, um, uh, England and Wales have 11 sediment cells that are hypothesized, and then within those are sub cells. So the sub cells of ochre coke do, do not mix with the sub cells of Hatteras. You would think those outer bank sediment sources are continuous, but they're really not. So we start to take all these pieces into account, and then we start to think about dredging and I was looking at some dredging information and kind of just got lost in the world of dredging. I have this um, real interest in land use history and it's always focused on the coast and it's primarily been centered around Longleaf Pine and how the economies of those early counties really grew up around this forest type. And I was always amazed by the amount of work and labor that would go on without sort of our modern tools. It, and then I started looking into dredging and found the same thing and it is just, absolutely remarkable how humans can go into any system and really manipulate it um, even without the modern conveniences that we have today to manipulate systems that we have. So I'll just kind of let you look at these different entries at your leisure along this timeline of history of dredging and there are many many more entries. I had to kind of select a few. The one that really caught my eye was the dismal eye, um, the dismal eye, the dismal swamp canal which was essentially started in 1793. However, um, it was noted um, and visited by George Washington. It was originally discussed as early as 1725 that we should have a canal that connects the Albemarle Sound with the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia. And it is 22 miles long. It is the longest operating man-made canal in the United States and it was completely dug by hand. Now, horrendously, it was primarily dug by slave labor at the time, or what they called enslaved labor. I'm not quite sure what the distinction is there, but um, it, it's just remarkable how we've been able to modify these wetlands over time, and they still continue to provide these services. It's really just now that we're seeing this ramping up of marshes not being able to continue to provide these services. So then we move on to sort of the next chunks of time and we see um, in the early, I should say, actually, I'm going to go back for a second because things really started to change in 1867 with um, the development of the suction dredge. That really changed the playing field. I mean, you could do massive amounts of dredging in a much shorter amount of time 
than compared to previously. So by the time we get into the mid, uh, the early to mid 1900s, we are doing major numbers of projects. But by the time we get to today, and this is just startling to me, there are 25,000 miles of maintained waterways. Now, you might turn around and say, well, there's a lot of highways. There's, I looked it up, there's 165,000 miles of highways. These are underwater and um, they seem a lot harder than highways. So it's kind of like a human years, dog years things for me. Uh, 25,000 miles of channels are maintained and all of that maintenance involves the removal of sediment and therein lies the problem. So we dredge a lot. Um, these are some figures from the Army Corps of Engineers dredging and dredged material management book in 2015. And as indicated on the timeline, you can see that the majority of works going on in these waterways is maintenance. We do not do a whole lot of new projects. There just isn't any place to do them, right? We're not gonna put in a major port on the Eastern Seaboard. There is nowhere to put in a major port on the Eastern Seaboard. So although there are some new projects, the majority of projects where we do dredging are maintenance projects. So we know about them, we know where they are, um, we know areas that shoal all the time, and we have to dispose of all that sediment. And that, um, that kind of gets us to where we, um, we are in this project. So a little bit more information about thin layer application. So thin layer application is the primary beneficial use that we're gonna talk about in this project. We are gonna talk a little bit about living shorelines um, in this project, and we will use them in conjunction with thin layer application, and we may even do some oyster cells and living shorelines in conjunction with thin layer application, but this is really what we're talking about in this project. We take the sediment that's being dredged and we spray it onto a marsh in a thin layer. I mean, that is like boiling it down to its most basic um, idea. This has been going on since the 70s. It wasn't quite as rigorous in the 70s as it is now. Um, we've developed things like RTK, which allow us to get sub-centimeter um, elevation measurements in marshes, um, which really wasn't available to the average marsh scientist in the 70s, right? So we have all kinds of new tools that allow us to be much more precise. They tended to over apply the sediment. Um, there were some missteps where they would apply like a meter of sediment and the marsh was just crushed. But even where they over applied it or applied it to a marsh that maybe wasn't really in need of it, overwhelmingly the marshes respond really well to 10 to 20 meter to 10 to 20 centimeters, excuse me, of sediment applied to their surface. It is that bump up in elevation of 10 to 20 centimeters that in our marshes in the coast of North Carolina is the equivalent of about 25 years of sediment that makes a major difference in sea level rise. Our marshes um, here in North Carolina are a little more microtidal than say the ones we're gonna be working at in Florida. So we have to be a little bit more careful about how much sediment we apply, but marshes appear to be very, um, adaptive to this amount of sediment as long as you don't over apply. So the challenges are really interesting. There are massive regulatory challenges associated with this and I think they're so daunting that the majority of managers just cannot deal with it, right? It is just too burdensome, they have full-time jobs and the, uh, the regulatory environment is still really getting used to this. So permitting and uh, it, it, it is a non-trivial matter. But the problem is we're running out of places to put sediment. Um, in 2017, the Army Corps of Engineers established some new guidance for the placement of dredged sediment and um, dredged material placement facilities that are owned by the Army Corps of Engineers are no longer available to use, to use by private dredging. And the majority of dredging is done by private dredging um, for non-federal interests. So if you are dredging something that is not directly related to federal interests, like the Intracoastal Waterway, you can no longer put your sediment in Army Corps of Engineers places. And it is expensive to move sediment. It is expensive to put sediment on a barge and move it. You can only pipe it so far. So we are running out of cheap places to put sediment. Thin layer application will not be the solution for all of the sediment, but it will be an application in use for some of the sediment. And we're also going to have more resilient marshes by doing it. So that is one of the things. And I don't know if you noticed on the other slide, and I'm not sure I mentioned it, but 95% of dredged sediment is considered clean. It is not contaminated like you would expect by certain types of industries 
um, that may be right on water that have discharged that may contaminate sediments. 95% of our sediment is considered clean and 60% of all sediment that is dredged from, did I actually, let me, I am going to, well, because I don't have too many more slides, I'm actually going to go back for a second and, and, and talk about this number for a minute. 212 million cubic yards per year between the years of 2008 and 2012. So 95% um, of that was clean and 60% of it was put in offshore ocean disposal sites. There are 108 offshore disp disposal sites run by the um, Army Corps of Engineers and approved by the EPA. And that's where over half of the dredging material goes. The other half goes to spoil islands, it goes to beaches, um, rivering uh, sandbars that they build in the middle of rivers now, and hopefully more and more um, to marshes. So I thanks for going back there with me, because now I want to move into a little bit more about our project. So. We are trying to keep marsh set, uh, we're trying to keep dredge sediment in the system and apply it to marshes to increase that marsh resilience. And because we sit in these sediment and marsh areas that are unique to multiple players, it is super important that we bring all the stakeholders together. So that was a core of this project is bring stakeholders together in our two research sites in North Carolina and Florida. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about those. We're gonna evaluate the habitat and the marsh, the dredging options, and consider what we call NNBF, nature, natural and nature-based features. So that can be thin layer application, it can be living shorelines, and then anything else associated with it. We are not considering things like bulkheads. That is not what we're doing here. We're not filling in behind bulkheads. Um, we are sticking with nature-based approaches that utilize dredging materials. So here's where we're working. We're working in Florida and in North Carolina. And you will see up and down the coast, we have both military installations, um, ports, communities, municipalities, and these organizations and these agencies, they all have their own unique goals and challenges, but they all sit in a community region and they have coastal marsh resources, they have sediment management challenges, um, and they've communicated those challenges with us. We have letters of support from all of our partners about sediment disposal and storage and or marsh resilience. And ports are really important here. Ports are um, a way that we receive so many goods in this country. Ports are multi-billion dollar businesses as well for communities. And it's not just about the ports, but it's about the roads that lead away from the ports. And if you drive to Moorhead City and Beaufort and you drive by uh, the port in North Carolina, the skinny little causeway road leads to it and is surrounded by marsh. So if you think about all the challenges, it's pretty, pretty scary. So just a little bit more information about some of our sites. So this is, these are the sites in Florida. Um, our main partners are Jack, what we call Jack's Port. That's the port of Jacksonville. And there's actually four terminals there. We're talking about Blunt Island, which is a Marine Corps command. So this little island, can y'all see that cursor moving around? Emily, just nod, thank you. Um, so this is Blunt Island, half of it is owned by the Marine Corps and half of it is owned by Jack's Port. And then this huge area over here is the Timucuan Ecological Preserve. And it is 45,000 acres of um, coastal salt marsh and it's one of the most intact salt marsh estuaries in the southeastern United States. So this Marine Corps facility here is 1,100 acres. And then the other side, which is one of the ports of Jacksonville is another thousand acres. And in 2018, the port began a $484 million project to deepen the shipping channel that goes from the inlet to a port that is well upstream from Blunt Island, um, this center island again here. And it is to allow um, the world's largest shipping containers to get access to the ports. It is going to be one of the largest widenings on the East Coast, in addition to ports like Savannah, right? So this is huge. Um, the Jacksonville port generates an average of 2.7 billion, that's with a B, dollars of economy to Florida. So these are major places doing major economic, major national security activities. And they are sitting in the middle of the St. Johns River that is surrounded by marsh, um, and they are dredging. And the idea that these partners aren't all getting together to figure out how to deal with sediment 
is somewhat alarming. I don't know if you can see right here, and I'm gonna move the cursor. So the cursor's there and then I move it. There's that little change in color right there. That is actually, and I'm sorry, I don't have a zoomed in image. That is actually a sediment disposal area. And it costs millions of dollars to build it. And they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year maintaining it. And they keep having to build a wall higher and the causeway, which is really the wall, it's what they drive on the top of it. And I just recently drove around it because we were flying drones out there to do some mapping for them of this spoil island. And it is remarkable. And there's a community on one side of it. And you think about that, that earthen causeway um, wall collapsing at some day under the weight of all that sediment and, and marsh muck and water and it is just unbelievable that that's how the sediment is being managed there so there's a, a, a tremendous amount of work that can be done in that area particularly by bringing all the regional partners together and this is our study site in north carolina it is the port of moorhead city um, the town of beaufort it is always helpful to know the mayor of beaufort who is really supportive of projects like this. And it is also the Rachel Carson Reserve, which is part of NEARS, the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. And these guys share the same exact concerns um, as that those communities in Florida do. It's just probably on a little bit different of a scale. Um, the Port of Moorhead City um, is just three miles away from the town of Beaufort. So here's the port and here's the town of Beaufort. And this is the Rachel Carson Reserve, just in case this image is a little bit too small for folks to recognize exactly where they're sitting. I mean, I think I changed my, my screen setting there. Sorry about that if I um, messed with it. Okay. Emily, does that screen look right to you? You can just nod. Okay, thank you, Calvin. I saw your nod. I appreciate that. Um, the, this port, although not as big as Jacksonville, provides about a billion dollars worth of economic growth to our state in North Carolina. And if you've never been to the Rachel Carson Reserve, it is an extraordinary salt marsh that is the host to many species, and it buffers the town of Beaufort. So the critical nature of all of these places combined to manage sediment um, became pretty clear to us when we were putting together study sites. So here's what we're going to be doing just a little bit on our workflow. Um, and our tasks, uh, it all starts with stakeholder engagement again. Nothing we do happens without stakeholders. If they're not interested, we have no project. And I think when we talk about um, the economic benefits for some stakeholders and then the ecological benefits for other stakeholders, we really appeal to them. And it doesn't matter that they're all interested in different things because the work that goes on in this project and bringing them together really benefits all of them in different ways. So we have to identify, identify the dredging projects. We have to assess the dredging area and the sediment characteristics. Then we move into the sediment placement options. And this is where I really um, will lean on our partners from the Army Corps of Engineers and EA Engineering. These guys are, um, they, they've been doing marsh restoration work for years and they understand how you need to engineer these projects to get the greatest amount of benefit with the least amount of impact into the marshes. We assess marsh vulnerability. Can these marshes handle the sediment that we want to put on? Will it increase um, their productivity and their ability to catch additional sediment as it comes in? We want to always bring in our regulators. If we're not doing this with them sitting by our side, then we are not perhaps doing the work within the framework that they're going to be building into the future, and that's really important. And then, of course, we will hopefully have a decision support tool that has applications well beyond these places. We think the approach that we're going to take to align these partners um, and align the dredging with the use will be applicable across the Southeast in a variety of different settings. Oh, gosh, I can't wait till we can all get back out in these marshes and do a little bit of kayaking and canoeing and exploring it just when you get out into these systems you you really sort of remember how important they are aside from all the stuff that we've been talking about so again just our goals just to kind of summarize it and bring it all together um, and our outcome and i'm not going to talk about these last three slides because i feel like i have talked more than enough but i just want you to know they're there because emily's going to post this and is all they are is showing you some examples of some projects that I was involved with at Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune. We're, I'll just tell you about them. <laughs> we, did, um, we, we did two projects. One was um, an, rising the elevation of the marsh where it was low. And you can see this is just a pilot 
project with small areas. And the other one was filling in open water. That open water to vegetation ratio is a really good predictor of whether or not a marsh is gonna break up and convert to open water. And we saw that happening here. And this place is called Mile Hammock Bay and it is critical for shielding the Marine Corps base from um, wave and wake energy. So this was, this was the thin layer disposal of the dredge material. Um, where we were just raising elevation and because we were doing it experimentally we didn't have a big army core dredge and it was a tedious process to use this little pump system but it worked and we went back after florence and did some measurements and the marsh is just thriving um it, it's just turned out to be a great little demonstration and then the other one is um advance this what have i done emily Oh, there we go. And the other one was this open ponded area um, where you can see them. And um, it, these are just beautiful marshes. And this, both of these marshes are also very subject to wind and wake energy. So we were also addressing living shorelines. So with that, I will stop. And um, that's a lot of talking. So if there are any questions or comments, I really like comments um, and thoughts. I welcome those. Yeah, so I think if, if folks have questions or comments, please feel free to unmute yourself. And like I said before, I think if, if too many people start talking, we might use the chat feature, but go ahead and unmute yourself if you want to ask a question and go ahead and ask it. Or not. You don't have well, to ask any questions. That's okay, this too. Is, this <laughs> is Phil Burke. Hi, Phil. And if there was ever a good lecture or a way to listen to somebody that's passionate about their subject, it's you, so it's Susan. Oh, you're so nice. Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, your talk this morning. And somebody that does land use environmental planning and works at the community level a lot, I was wondering if the science that you're producing, like, can we eventually know where stretches of high value marsh systems are that are most threatened? by erosion and where you know there's there's a need to not intrude like uh perhaps we could avoid dredging or or you know laying uh sediment on top you were saying that was be the first step but if we need to there's available sediment supply so i guess high value marsh system threaten most availability of sediment supply um yeah, that is a good okay. question. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering, just like if if you were to do a land use plan for you know for coastal protection of natural systems and that kind of thing. Oh, Mike told me you're a big thinker. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, no, no. Uh, so want, high value I just, marshes. I think a high value marsh means something different to a lot of different people. Yeah. I think if you're talking to Paris Island in South Carolina. A high value marsh is one that is wide enough to absorb enough wind and wave energy and protect infrastructure. But if you're talking to John Fussell, birder extraordinaire in the Southeast, a high value marsh is one that is going to support a healthy population of an endangered clapper rail population, right? Okay. But I think we can do an assessment. I think rather than assessing high, higher low value marshes we assess vulnerability of marshes okay and then other people can decide based on their needs and challenges if that vulnerability or if the if a marsh that is determined to be vulnerable has a high value to them now i think you and i agree like intrinsically all these marshes have value and you know but but being kind of practical right and remembering some end users and what they have to think about and their challenges that they are addressing as managers um, i think vulnerability would be the thing to provide them with and but we have to and that's assuming they know the value of their marsh right and if they don't and we're trying to convince them then we need to find the value that appeals to them um I don't think we'll ever, yeah, go ahead. Isn't that available like mapping ecosystem services or? Oh yeah, it know. is widely and broadly available. Um, mm -hmm. I think what isn't is how vulnerable right. some of these marshes are. Yeah. And, you know, if you don't have an estimate of 
suspended sediment concentration? Can you not do anything? Well, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think you could do a better job if you have suspended sediment concentrations, but I think there are a lot of tools now like this open water to vegetated ratio that has proven out in a lot of systems. That's a really quick way where we could even regionally, you know, look at, look at imagery and do that calculation. And then we have these amazing multi and hyperspectral satellite images that come down on sometimes daily basis or will in the future. And then we can look at marsh health, right? We can look at like their spectral signatures and look at health. So we, I think we have the tools now to start being able to do bigger, broader and better regional assessments of vulnerability rather than, you know, we, we see these big regional tools online a lot and it's always like the first pass. It's like, yeah, it's really general, but you can't use it for planning. Right? It just sort of gives you a sense of what's going on. But I think we have some tools now that will allow us to categorize marsh vulnerability and get really good at it to the point where you could almost start thinking about your management responses. Um, that and would now be it's really cool. Yeah, there's a yeah. research project. I don't there. think we'll ever get away from dredging all together, Phil. I mean, you look at that, it is a, we have gotten into like, we're on the hamster wheel of dredging, right? Look at the intracoastal waterway. <laughs> it, is, right. it is amazing. I don't think I answered all your questions. I think I lost track yeah. a little bit. That's okay. But I look forward to talking to you more about this yeah. and seeing how we fit into your resilience center. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Susan, so I have a question. Um, right. thinking, ahead, Mike. <laughs> sorry. Thinking ahead, um, thin layer is great, and it's wonderful that you guys are going to be assessing it on this, this scale and, and with this level of depth in terms of communicating with the stakeholders. But when I do the calculations, the same ones that you always have, it just doesn't use a giant volume of sediment. Mm -hmm. So is there any way, and are there people thinking, I just don't know about this, uh, about kind of slow release thin layer, ways you could build adjacent sand berms that would slowly erode into the marsh? Is there anything that we've learned from that land water margin that you can manipulate it in a way that you would be enhancing the local sediment supply over a longer period of time? It's like that giant project the Dutch did, right? Where they yeah. put all that massive amount of sand on the beach and then over time they've been letting the waves and water carry it down and do the work for them. I have not heard anybody talking about sort of having like a resource area where then you could pull from, let me back up. There is no question that we will never use all the sediment that is produced by dredging in thin layer application. No way, not happening. There will always be offshore. There will always be spoil islands. And I think the idea more is while you're dredging this sediment up and you've got marshes right near them that are clearly not going to persist in the face of sea level rise, why don't you put sediment on the marsh, right? So I think that's one sort of, yeah, we need to use that sediment in a way that keeps it in the system, um, but we'll never use it all. So we've talked about things like, can you repeat application on the same cycle that you dredge? So can the marsh handle 10 centimeters every three years? Well, if it's subsiding enough, then it probably can. So we have definitely started talking into talking about longer term strategies to deal with massive quantities. And, but I hadn't heard anybody talk about sort of like having like a berm that slowly, have you seen work on that? Because now I'd like no, to think about that. I haven't. So in some places it won't work because you won't get a permit if you stop the flow of water right. into marshes. Right, what, and the whole what, idea of enhancing local total suspended solids is problematic right. from a water quality standpoint. But I'm writing that down because I'd like to think about that some more. Um, and those are some ideas that we could work in on a small scale to this project and track over time and sort of add a little extra science piece that we hadn't think about. So that was a good idea. It just seems to get past the barrier you refer to, and that is that moving sediment is so expensive. So even if oh. you can apply multiple times, it's going to end up having a fairly high cost. So if projects you like it, deepening, you know, deepening a river to you know 60 feet that and the river's eight miles long i think those circumstances you're kind of screwed i don't know we're smart creative people we can probably come up with something we'll get phil we'll get alan ives right we can figure something out i think we yeah, need we to continue can. talking about that uh 
if I if I could build on that a little bit, um, I know ten years ago there was a major push on the East Coast to do a lot of dredging to deepen the channels because of the Panama Canal expansion. Um, my sense was a lot of those projects got kind of hung up in environmental impact statement, and a lot of the problem was was dealing with the dredge spoil and stuff like that, and so. I'm wondering if a technique like this, if there was a way to deal with that kind of volume, um, whether it's Mike's idea of the kind of the slow release or whatever it is, would would help kind of um, tilt the scales uh, and and make projects like that a little bit more feasible. Absolutely. I mean, when I think about something like an inlet where they do side cast dredging for the most part, not exclusively. So when they a lot of inlets, when they dredge it, they dredge it out of the main channel, and then they just dump it off to the side, hence the name side cast dredging. And that does keep it in the system, but it also means they're constantly having to dredge. So also, in the St. John's River, will they entertain, or in Savannah, or anywhere else that they're looking to deepen, would they entertain something like side cast dredge? Um, if it meant they had to dredge more often, I don't know, but God, this is really interesting, you guys. We should really, this is writing things down. Brian's on the team now, <laughs> but you're gonna have to shave. I'm just kidding. Yeah, this That's is really I get my hair cut. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is really, um, how do you deal with those volumes? It's so much sediment. I need to try to kind of relate it to something like how many football fields or how many dump trucks. So we can sort of, you know, we, when, when you say, oh, it's 200 million cubic yards. I want to say a curse word and then put ton after it. That's how much sediment it is, right? I mean, it's a lot of sediment. So this is, yeah, um, we think of it, how can we take some of the sediment, do something really good with it and preserve ecosystem services, but there's, the majority of it still has to be disposed of. So, all right, project number two, I'm glad we're building a team. Other questions, anybody else have a question? Feel free to jump in. We're gonna talk about this project for three years, so I hope you guys <laughs> like it. Hey, Susan, can you hear me? Susan, oh. this is George Howard, can you hear me? I can. Okay, sorry, I've, uh, I'm, I'm getting a, uh, a message that says my uh, internet is unstable and it is making me unstable as well. <laughs> I'm getting your, a little bit of your um, your sound is going on and off, but I know it's just my problem, my chives. Um, quick question, what kind of mortality do you see in the vegetation and, and then uh, also the critters? I mean, I expect there's some because they're regulatory concerns and you know, by doing the thin layer stuff, it seems to be uh, trying to mitigate that how much is that mitigation of that um, just speak to kind of the mortality and how, how quickly does it bounce back that kind of stuff so we saw almost in that Freeman Creek project that we did where we did about I think it ended up being 14 centimeters um, we don't see really a loss of vegetation you think oh it's buried it's going to die but that is not what we see there and then in fact we saw increasing amounts of biomass above ground but then again, there, there is that threshold where if you put too much on and you smother everything, you clearly kill the vegetation. There is always a de decrease in some of the critters, but we haven't seen a decrease to the point where there wasn't a rebounding of the population also. So I think that's why we've been able to get permits and there have been nationwide permits and they all are required to address these things. Um, they've looked at all kinds of benthic and um, snails and, and primary nursery areas so all those kinds of critters also and there doesn't seem to be again if you don't cross that threshold of too much sediment a permanent decrease in any of these populations and in fact you know i would then start to argue well if the marsh goes away ultimately you will have none of them now that is not an argument that goes into a regulatory permit <laughs> right um but that's sort of that more common sense thing where i may have a decrease initially but i expect it to rebound and um Sometimes the biomass sort of has a peak where it, you, you have um, a post-recovery where the biomass goes higher than it was originally, and then it tends to equilibrate back down to the original 
biomass of the marsh, assuming it wasn't drowning. If it was drowning and you were starting to lose vegetation, you would expect an overall increase. So as long as you don't put too much, there was one project in Georgia in the 70s. And I mean, it was like a meter of sediment. It was just a disaster. <laughs> I think they ended up going back and replanting it and working on it some more and it ultimately recovered. Um, but in general, the, it, it tends to be a pretty low intensity. It looks super high intensity when you're doing it, but it tends to be a pretty low intensity um, restoration method. Sometimes they use heavy equipment though. And, and we look at Did that. Did I hear you say 14 centimeters was kind of the sweet spot? For for our marshes must, that we I'm found in this coast of North Carolina, I'd say between 10 and 20. Okay. And again, the more microtidal your marshes, the less room you have for error. So if I were going to go in any direction, I would always go less. And then knowing they're coming back in three years to dredge some more, I can always do a reapplication. I would always err on the side of caution. You won't get a permit if they think there's danger of you turning it into what they call an upland. They being the regulatory community, Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? We got a couple more minutes before the, the breakfast ends. This is Mike again. Oh, I, I, think, was say I hate presenting on Zoom, but it's been fun being with you guys this morning. One thing that goes without saying, I hope, is that probably we're in a time where disposal isn't necessarily going to have to happen if there is anywhere where people live within range, because everybody at the coast wants right. elevation. So right. just upland disposal is hopefully an option. It may not work necessarily in Jacksonville, where it looks like a long distance, but at least you could do it on places with, with infrastructure. And I think you could even do, I mean, it's all about money, right? At the end of the day, I hate to say it, but you know, if you have a, a, a marsh that is, I'm working on a project at Cherry Point right now at bombing range, uh, BT 11, bombing training 11. And it sits out in the base of the Noose River and the part of the Pamlico Sound. And it is one of the premier open water bombing ranges for uh, the Marine Corps and joint exercises they do with the Navy and Army as well. And it is really coming under some pressures of sea level rise. And, but there is no source of dredge sediment there. And that marsh is in trouble and they will preserve that, that area even if it ends up being bulkheaded and filled in with sediment they bring in somewhere else, which we want to absolutely avoid because the area around Piney Island um, is rich in fish and oysters. It is super productive. Um, so we're actually talking about barging in just a small amount of sediment, not, not to do the full thin layer approach, but just to fill in some of the open water areas to reduce that ratio of open water to marsh. So doing it really selectively, and we have to be super selective because it is, Mike, you're right, to, to barge sand around is very expensive and this is one place where we wish they dredged because we want a source of sediment and we don't have one so but yeah if there's a community sediment for everybody oh phil we're gonna have so much fun in your resilience center <laughs> i'm so excited you're coming <laughs> just need to get over this uh virus business <laughs> I'm in Texas at the moment. I'm looking forward to coming back in August. We'll get you back. We'll get you back. We'll send a rescue party. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I think that looks like the end of the bagel breakfast. So thanks everybody for coming. Thank you, Susan, for presenting. It was fantastic. Um, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks, Emily. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. That was great.